Hello, and welcome to a very special feature on Jurassic Outpost. Uh, we were lucky enough to speak with Scott Kramer, who was the executive producer and showrunner on Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. Welcome to Camp Cretaceous. Now, I want to warn you, this is a spoiler-based episode. We talk spoilers of all of season one, so don't listen to this until you've seen season one. However, you should see season one. It's on Netflix now, and it is great. Anyway, sit back and enjoy the interview. If you could just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself for uh, our, our listeners so they can get to know you and what you do. My name is Scott Kramer. I'm the executive producer of Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to kind of, uh, along with uh, Aaron Hammersley, to be the showrunner of this fine program. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, my job is basically to, uh, to put the talented people on this crew in a position to succeed and then, uh, you know, try not to mess it up. So there we are. So, uh, have you been involved with what became Camp Cretaceous since day one? And could you talk a little bit like what it was since inception since when you came on? Yeah, well, no. Uh, you know, Zach Stentz, uh pitched the original idea. Uh, I was just talking to him, and uh, I think he said his first email to or from DreamWorks was like April of 2017. And so they started developing right around that time. I came onto the show about a year later, um, and they, you know, they – they had a, a you know an early pilot script and some concept art and uh, some of that early art that got uh, put out there into the um, out into the press uh, was that early concept art. Uh, so yeah, so I came in around June 2018, uh, caught me completely off guard, but you know incredibly excited uh, to be part of this whole uh, universe. And so, yeah, then it was just uh, kind of full speed ahead, getting the pilot uh, into shape, talking about these characters and, uh, you know, uh, building, uh, start building this world. So I have a general question. I know there's been a lot of questions about, is this show canon? And I know that you've said over and over again, yes, it's canon. I promise <laughs> you it's canon. Um, so I guess now my question really would be, what does that mean for this show to be canon? What does that mean for you as uh, a writer and executive producer and a creator on the show? How how do you navigate the Jurassic World canon? Were there times that you had to rearrange something um, to fit within the canon? Or did you have to work with outside parties to make sure that things fit in? I guess just like, what is that process like? Well, I mean, uh, a huge part of it is Colin Trevorrow has been really hands-on on this project from the get-go. So he has sat in our writer's room on numerous occasions. Uh, he looks at everything we write. He looks at all the designs. And so that's, you know, that's a huge part of it. Um, the, uh, you know, as far as, like, just for, uh, you know, for the story that we've told here in these eight episodes, a lot of that was just us watching and rewatching the movies over and over again just as far as the canon of the movie Jurassic World, you know, just where it makes sense for our characters to be, uh, you know, where is there gaps in the movie where we could insinuate them? Where can we see, you know, where can we see the aviary scene from a different point of view? Where can we come upon Zach and Graves' uh, gyrosphere, you know, and the fact that, okay, well, we know there's, an ankylosaurus there. Well, why don't we make our dinosaur up front, our adorable bumpy, an ankylosaurus? So it, it, you know, it makes sense that that could have been the herd that bumpy was with. So, you know, I don't know if that's more continuity than canon. Um, you know, there's a lot of responsibility just doing a show with Jurassic in the title uh, and making it full canon ups that responsibility. But, you know, I have also said a bunch of times this crew was a bunch of fans before we ever got this job. So, you know, we've worked really hard. I know, uh, you know, like anything else, I'm sure we're going to have some missteps here and there that people uh, will bring up, but uh, it ain't for lack of effort. 
we're, we're really trying very hard to make this feel part of the world, whether it's name checking Dr. Grant, Dr. Sadler, whatever we can do. You know, we like the Easter eggs where we can put them. We just don't want to, we tried not to shoehorn them in where they didn't fit. Yeah, I thought it was really, really natural. Uh, cool. I saw the show before there was any feedback or anything online available for it. So I went in completely blind. And uh, my biggest takeaway right away was just how pleasantly surprised I was with the show. It was just absolute absolute joy to watch it's really really fun and it takes itself seriously and it just gets it right and i think that everything i've just been reading online seems like most it's resonating with most people even just searching camp cretaceous on like twitter and you just go to the recent tweets just with everyone really it seems to be resonating really well yeah that you know that's incredibly gratifying especially you know just seeing there was a lot of comments early on. It's like, oh, it's going to be the kitty version. Oh, nobody's going to die. And I'm just going, well, let's wait. It's coming. Uh, but you don't you don't know. You know, like I said, I'm proud of I stand behind this show. I'm very proud of it to see the reaction and to see the positivity coming out of the Internet, which, you know, isn't always the case. Uh, it's been incredibly humbling and incredibly wonderful. And and uh, the crew, everyone, it's just been, it's been amazing. Yeah, no, I think it's been, it's been so much fun for the fan community um, to, I think, <laughs> you know, normally when there's, a, especially in fan driven communities, there's always so much divisiveness when something comes out and everyone seems to be enjoying the show and pleasantly surprised by it and they can't wait to see what happens next. And uh, that is always a great experience. And that's kind of the crazy part is even the super fans that are can't, continuity driven, everyone's like, hey, this show gets it. It's it right. It's really cool. Oh, that's, oh, that's really neat. Yeah. And there's a lot of really cool elements that are uh, new and introduced into the show. Um, so I guess that's another thing when we were talking about canon and how much free, free reign did you have to work with things like bioluminescent parasaurs, which is one of my favorite concepts. I really like that thing. And that scene was just, you know, a really, really neat scene. Um, or Bumpy, a baby ankylosaurus, you had to define a new design because there hasn't been a baby ankylosaurus before. So like, what what does that kind of look like when creating something? Well, the uh, Parasaurolophus scene in the cave, which I just love. I, I love so much about that. Just the, the water effects that we're able to get and the score that Leo put down. Like, there's a lot of that thing I love. And a lot of that actually came from, uh, from more of that concept art, that early concept art that we saw. And it's like, okay, well, let's do that. And it actually worked out well because you do have production limitations. So there's there's a water park on Jurassic World. We were gonna we were trying to figure out some water thing that ends up with them with the Mosasaurus, and production wise that wasn't gonna work. And then we went, well, what about this cool luminescent bioluminescent algae and and, and the parasaurs? And so it's like, okay, well that that was really effective. Um, as far as everything, you know, like I said. Colin, Frank Marshall looks at everything. We hear from Frank. Stephen has given the, you know, we've, we've run Stephen through a, 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 a couple times. And, you know, they, they don't want us to, they didn't want us to do like a whitewashed kitty version. They want us to stay with the canon. But there's been an amazing amount of trust from them to still, with all that, tell the story we want to tell. And that's, you know, that's what we've tried to do. Uh, you know, with Bumpy, it's, you know, I'm very excited for the baby Yoda-like love of Bumpy. It's been incredibly gratifying, you know. So uh, it's just we they trusted us to, to tell tell the story. And it, it feels like it's, uh, at least it's being accepted. As it, it fits into the universe. And it's, it's like, okay, well, we're in there now. So. So uh, speaking of fitting into the universe, the show obviously is not over. Uh, it definitely ends on a cliffhanger. I don't think there's ever been really any doubt that there would be future seasons, but I think it's safe to assume there are future seasons. Um, well, you didn't hear that from me. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was going somewhere with that, and then my uh, questions just disappeared. So I am sorry about that. No problem at all. I got no place to be. <laughs> um. Oh, you know what? I have a general – it's completely off from what I was talking about before, but I have a general question. So there are a lot of – the dinosaurs look really interesting in this show. There are some shots that look 
almost photorealistic in a way that like a stop motion model would look photorealistic. Uh, was that an intentional? Uh... <laughs> well, look, we're trying to get them as close as we could. We got the models for a lot of the dinosaurs from ILM. Now, these models with the textures and the surfaces and the details, way too big for a uh, TV pipeline. So, mm -hmm. but, you know, incredible reference. You know, some of the sets, too. We had the reference set for the, uh, the, the Jurassic World Lagoon, the most source lagoon. So we got an amazing design team uh, led by J.P. Valme and uh, Christophe Ache, and they basically took the reference broke it down, did a simplified version, which don't look all that simple, you know, and, but, you know, if you, if you put, like, our Indominus next to the, the movie Indominus, you'll see, you know, there's some features that are exaggerated, there's just a slightly less detail, but, I mean, we wanted to go for it, and uh, so, yeah, we were, you know, it's like, there was also the early teaser that came out was like a raptor uh, stalking the camera and mm -hmm. everyone went, oh, which raptor is like, you know, honestly as a generic raptor, we're doing an animation test and everybody lost their minds over it and it's like, okay, well, I guess we have a teaser now. So um, yeah, so yeah, we, we took a lot of care for not just the dinosaurs, but for the jungle and, mm -hmm. and just to have as you know, you can't do that with human characters because you get all uncanny valley with it and it, if it looks too much. So, uh, so yeah, we, we were really shooting for it. The, the, or the nervous thing early days was we didn't know if the stylized human characters, like, we were hoping it was going to marry with the realistic dinosaurs in the backgrounds. But we didn't know. And I don't know what would happen if they didn't because, like, we already had everything going, so... There was a – when uh, some of the first toy images came out, they had pictures of the characters and the dinosaurs, and that was the fans' first look. There was a lot of, uh, I guess, worry from fans when they just saw it on the packaging. They didn't think it was working, and then as soon as they saw the show, they're like, oh, wow, it works. Yeah. It, it works. It works really well. So, like, it was really interesting just to see that turnaround, and that's why it just sometimes it matters, like, to have, like, the right, the right first look and mm -hmm. why uh, sometimes toys come out earlier in – make it a little confusing for marketing, but it worked out because now people are excited and there are a bunch of dinosaurs in the toy line that aren't in the show yet. So I'm say, assuming there might be some room for extrapolation. Maybe. You know that. Yeah. yeah Baryonyx, Ceratosaurus, a few others. I think I saw those. Um, yeah. Well, we'll have to see what happens, but, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're hopeful. We have more stories. The there's top. a lot of room to play, and since Colin's been involved, do you think that there's opportunities that the movies might turn around and reference things that maybe Camp Cretaceous established, or elements that Camp Cretaceous has? Could could there be some could there be connections that could be? Different? I mean, could there? Absolutely. Uh, will there? It's hard to tell. Just you know, one of the things we're facing is you know our show takes place in 2015. Mm -hmm. So you got you know a three year time jump and until uh, Fallen Kingdom and then to whatever uh, Dominion is being set. So yes, is it is it possible? Yeah, I but I don't know if, if that would actually happen. But that was another great thing with having Colin involved. Is like you know we got sneak peeks of what's coming in Dominion. I'm not going to tell you any of those things, but it's like as far as whether it's dinosaurs or storylines or concepts to stay away from, like there was an early, you know, concept we had. It's like, oh, well, kind of doing something like that. So uh, that's why having Colin involved just uh, made all the difference. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I guess having that involvement means that if you wanted to start seeding things down the line, if that was a conversation that made sense, having – elements that sort of kind of playing off of one another that's an opportunity because it is something that's canon and something that everyone's involved with it's really organic mm -hmm. and that uh definitely i think that gives that's, it's a really interesting playground because you have this three-year time gap and there's just a lot of time to play with it i'm not assuming the kids are going to be on there quite for three years but well i guess we'll find out but one of the questions i do have about time length is how many could you say how many days the kids were on the island before the Indominus Rex broke free? 
in the end of season one. Is that something that's like open for interpretation? It's a little, you know, it's anywhere from a few days to I, I'd say it's definitely less than a week. Okay. So you know, it was one of those things that uh, if I could go back, I would probably make it more explicit that this is like a two week trip. Uh, and that uh, and that they've been on there a few a few days, yeah. So I don't know if I, if if we're we actually spell it out, but I would say they're they're on they're there for less than a week. So in theory, they're also like there there are potentially stories of these kids while the park was opened before everything. There even whether or not they're ever explored or not, there's still room for stories of them on the island before everything happened. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay, cool. That's just like kind of nice to know there's some some wiggle room there with some of the continuity and timeline because that just pop open for opportunity. Sure. Um, so the other question I have about then coming back is Manticore. That's a really yeah. interesting. Uh, that's a really really interesting element. Oh, by the way, Sammy's shirt being what ended up being in reference to Dennis Nedry. Didn't he catch it on the first watch and then the second watch it was like, oh, oh that. <laughs> That's brilliant. I'm glad yeah, that was cool. It's funny. Uh, Rainy Rodriguez, who voices uh, Sammy, texted me over the weekend that her aunt had discovered it, and it's like my aunt realized that I was wearing the same. And I, well, yeah, well, you got an eagle eye aunt then. So yes, I'm, I'm glad people are picking up on that. But uh, I, I'm assuming the Manticore story is something that we could probably hope to hear more about eventually in one way or another, or at least that's the hope. That's the hope, yes. Um, we get to continue on this journey and tell stories with these characters, which we would uh, love to do, then I would, uh, well, it seems like you'd, you'd want to hear more about Manticore. And, uh, oh, yeah. You know, maybe, maybe we will. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I definitely... I'm super excited because, you know, obviously Rival Corporations are a big part of, Jurassic, especially Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park and the Lost World. And uh, now that, you know, it's officially announced Dominion has Biosyn coming in and then that uh, this show has something called Manticore. And it's like there's suddenly this kind of really big inter interconnected world that suddenly seems a little sinister and a little bit larger. And you suddenly realize you don't know everything that's happening in it. And there's a lot of room to play. There might be surprises, I guess, is sort of the promise. Well, that, like, that's the hope. But, you know, it was definitely, we we came into this to try to build on what's there while still, you know, forging our own path. Uh, and another reference we really, really liked was seeing Isla Sorna show up at the uh, the beginning of the uh, VR game. Cool. That's, uh, you know, Sorna is something that the fans have a really deep affection for and have been just kind of chomping at the bit to, uh, continue stories on so every like little n n egg easter egg and reference for it just purposely oh I, was, perfectly I, was, I wasn't aware of the deep love but i thought that yeah we thought that would be a cool little little nugget there um so is there anything that you can then maybe tell us about your experience on camp cretaceous maybe a story that you think that fans would appreciate but maybe isn't a commonly asked question or just Huh, gosh. Uh, I feel like I've been asked about every every question under the sun. Um, no, I mean, what was cool was right right before we went from work, went on quarantine and worked from home, uh, Steven Spielberg came to DreamWorks and basically did this, it was really cool, this hour and a half uh, prison, just question and answer to everybody. And then after that, like at the end of that, then a few of us had to run back around to the screening room. And then I basically had to take them through everything for about 40 minutes. And a huge thank you again to Scott Kramer for taking time out of his busy schedule to do this interview for us. It was a blast and uh, we really enjoyed it and we hope you did as well. And if you did, please give it a like. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel. That is, if you like the video. And if you didn't like the video, I would say subscribe anyways and give our other videos a chance. Um, sorry for the abrupt ending to that video. We had some connection issues. It is the risk of doing interviews from afar. Uh, so our more natural ending kind of got lost in some garbled mess of audio. Um, now, in case you missed it, check out a description for a link 
of our video review and also for our Easter egg video. And upcoming, although it's not out yet, we have a video about Manticore that I know that our fans will surely like to devour. Um, we have now opened the Jurassic Outpost store selling Jurassic themed shirts, mugs, masks, and more. Check it out for some cool merchandise and check out the description for links to Zavi. If you use Outpost 20 at checkout on both Primal and Festival clothing collections, you get a 20% discount off of your order. And you can use Outpost 10 site-wide for 10% off your order. Hey, as always, head to JurassicOutpost.com for more news and information 